There we are. I'm, I am now. Sorry about that. Good morning to you. It's so good to be here, isn't it? And uh, oh, I hope you feel that. It is for me. Do you know, it's nearly, uh, nearly 100 days since Nikki and I arrived. We've been here nearly 100 days, and apparently that's significant, I'm told. Um, you know, if you're president of America, well, I'm not president of America. I'm really pleased to tell you. But I do have the absolute privilege with Nikki to be helping to lead in this, in this place and taking on the particular responsibilities of being the lead pastor within this amazing team and this amazing church family. So there's an, an element in what I'm going to be sharing of uh, reflecting on uh, what I'm, I'm thinking and imagining God might be just sort of pointing us a, a way forward. And I, I'm able to do that because it really comes out, you'll be so pleased to know, of, of what I'm sharing this morning, anyway, what I was anyway thinking of sharing, and just as I've been reflecting, just a few things come out of it. So I don't know, do you feel very summery? The weather's not that summery. I was, I was guaranteed that it always, the sun always shines in Cheltenham. This was the, uh, you, know, you know, at the end of your interview, when you get to ask your question, mine was, you know, what's the weather like, obviously? And I was told that, you know, well, apparently uh, the weather, uh, you know, is as dependent on weather forecasters as the economy is on economists. So, apologies if I've just offended any economists in the church family. We're, we're uh, coming to, it's the third in our series, Naturally Supernatural, isn't it? So, we're, we're thinking to ourselves, what does it look like to have a life that is completely inspired by, completely lived in God's, in God's power? Um, Nikki Gumbel, I'm, I, one of the things I do is the Bible in one year. Is there other people doing the Bible in one year? Uh, if, if, even though we're sort of halfway through the year, it, it, you could join now. It's so good. It's such good stuff that you get such good teaching. It's one of the ways that I really, uh, you know, try and open myself to God. And uh, Nikki Gumbel talking even today about life on God's terms. Life in the spirit, naturally supernatural, life on God's terms. Making the most of our lives was another expression that he used even this morning. Making the most of our lives. Are you, do you have a sense of making the most of your life? That's a, that's a great question to take into, into the summer, isn't it? We want to uh, share the truth that we're called as God's people to experience his presence normally and naturally in, in every part of our lives, in all our relationships, in our fun and in our workplaces and in wherever we serve, if we volunteer. We're just called, that's part of being a Christian, is to naturally, normally experience God's presence, to, to freely enjoy his gifts. Yeah, gifts are, are, are not just for a few. They're not for the, the premier division Christians. They're for every single one of us. God has gifts. Do you know what your gifts are? Do you know what your gifts could be? We're, we're naturally called as, as Christians. It's normal and natural. And, and maybe you're here today and you know a lot about God. But you don't really feel that you know God in that intimate kind of way. That in the children's slot was being expressed so powerfully. But rem reminding us about the parable of the lost son. Often that parable is called the, the, the parable of the searching father. Because the father's looking out and searching and it's normal and natural to, to receive gifts from our, our Father God in heaven. It's normal and natural to experience the fruit of his presence in our lives. And maybe you're here today and you're just feeling, you know, kind of you know about, but you don't really have that sense of God at work in your life. The experience of that closeness, the image, I, 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 forgive me, of course, for some of us, our experience of parenting and fathers is difficult. And we actually have to do the maths to get, to get past that in our thinking. But we can imagine what a perfect parent is like. And God is our perfect parent. And it's meant to be normal and natural to have that sense of closeness and relationship. Life on God's terms. We're meant to experience the same fruit in our lives as was experienced. And we, and we read about in the, in the Bible. There was no way that this stuff was, you know, sort of ran out and stopped. 
Some people we know have taught that in their past. Some even try to teach it now. They're not teaching the Bible, I humbly suggest. Because the Bible says that the stuff that happened when Jesus was here is now the stuff that's meant to happen quite normally and quite naturally for us in our everyday lives. And we're not, we're not talking about, as was said last week by Richard Leffley, one of the members of our church family who was sharing about taking risks in, in his workplace. It, it's not meant to be just water cooler moments. We don't believe in, as someone has famously said, God of the gaps. We don't believe in that. We believe God in everything. So if you were here last week, Richard was sharing, what is it to think about that email, that phone call, that conversation is an act of worship. What does that look like? To be so naturally filled with God's presence and God's power that that's the experience of our lives. And so in this three series, we we started by talking about what does it mean to be camped around God's presence? Because it is the desire for God's presence that is the root of all of this life. And we asked ourselves that question, are are we really camping out around? And we all know that camping can take a little bit of effort and work. And for some of us, maybe thinking to new wine, we're just wondering what it's going to be quite like. It's a conscious decision. Uh, David's asked you to email who you'd like to be camped next door to. A bit like you're not allowed to take a Bible on Desert Island Discs. You can't answer the right email, which is God. You'd like to be camped right alongside God at New Wine. Well, friends, you can be camped right alongside God here in Cheltenham, in Gloucester, wherever, wherever you come from, wherever you live. You can be camped if you want to be camped in God's presence. As, as Moses, we were thinking about Moses in the Old Testament, used to go to the tent of meeting, the special place where God said, I will meet with you. He would go intentionally and positively. It was, it was slightly set apart. And if we're willing to do the same things, if we're willing to say, yes, God, I am so serious, so desperate. I know my need for you. I want to camp out in your presence. Then we can be filled. Then we can be naturally supernatural, living the life that we're called to live. And then last week, as I've already referred to, we were thinking about taking the plunge with David's help and Richard's help. We were thinking about courage. And and Richard was saying, you know, courage and risk-taking, we're sometimes so tempted to think that it's only people who go to far-off lands to be missionaries who are the ones who are courageous and taking risks and bless them for what they do. But you may find, as others have said, you may find there are less Christians proportionately, percentage-wise, less Christians where you work, where you play, where you live than actually you would find if you were to go to the other side of the world. So where is courage? Where is risk-taking for you? That was the question Richard was asking. What does that look like in your family? What does it look like when you turn the conversation at the barbecue into what I really did this Sunday? And what really happened this Sunday? What does courage look like when you go into work and you speak to the, the person that you work with and you tell them what God did? There was this bit in our celebration where we stopped and the guy at the front invited God for others to pray. And as someone prayed for me, this is what happened. That's courage. That's risk. David's already referred to our money. And we don't say that because, uh, because, you know, we want your money. Please hear that. I I know exactly that's what it sounds like. I do know that that's exactly what it can sound like. But the truth that David was sharing with us, just as we even took took up our offering, is, as Jesus said, where our money is, that's where our heart is. And so risk-taking, courage, and living a life that's naturally supernatural, filled by the presence of God, might look like for us going back and thinking about our bank accounts and what they say about what we believe. And this week, in this third one, we're thinking about what does it mean to enjoy a summer of love? Because very simply and very plainly, the Bible is clear that God only has one concern. He only, he only dances with us if we're dancing to the tune 
of love. You see, the truth is, and we know this so well within the church, big C, we know the truth, don't we? That we can have our own agendas for God. Even in a church like ours, when we come and we pray for people, even as we come forward and we're invited to put our hand onto someone's shoulder, we can have our own agenda. We can be playing our own power games. Church leaders, capital C, not only talking about this church, church leaders can be the absolute worst. I stand before you and admit that. The absolute worst at playing out their own agendas. God's only concern, the only dance he's involved in, is the one of love. It is his nature. Back at the very beginning of the Old Testament part of our Bibles, Exodus 33. And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you to Moses. And I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. The nature of our God is mercy, compassion, love. Jesus embodied love, didn't he? Matthew 20, two blind men were sitting by the roadside and when they'd heard that Jesus was going by, they shouted, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. The crowd rebuked them and told them to be quiet, but they shouted all the louder, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. Jesus stopped and called them. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. Lord, they answered, we want our sight. Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes. Immediately they received their sight and followed him. This is the only agenda, the only dance, the only brief, the only vision that is in town for us as Christians. It's, it's who we're called to be. 1 John verse 4, 16, it's going to go on the screens. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. In this way, love is made complete among us. Colossians 3, 12. Paul writing to some baby Christians, some new Christians, uh, encouraging and urging them for maturity of faith. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. Clothe yourselves. Are we truly motivated by love. If we want to live this life as a church, if we want to share in Jesus' ministry, camping around his presence, God's presence, being willing to take steps of faith. A step of faith, by definition, is into something that you don't know the answer around. And thirdly, being motivated by love. See, love can be a slippery thing, can't it? Love can have its different agendas. A joke letter, I hasten to add this one. You may have heard it before, but anyway. Dearest Jimmy, the letter wrote, No words could ever express the great unhappiness I felt since we broke up. Please say you'll take me back. No one could ever take your place in my heart. I love you, I love you, I love you. Yours forever, Marie. P.S. And congratulations on winning the lottery. <laughs> a society, a culture where things are twisted and distorted. That's, that's the one that we live in, isn't it? Are you, are you conscious of the impact on, on each one of us, on every single one of us, of the relativism, that you know, everything is, all beliefs are relative, all beliefs are personal. Everything, everything boils down to personal choice. That, that's the environment that we're living and breathing and being in such a cynical 
cynical world. I mean, I'm not on FaceTube. Because <laughs> it's a really cynical place. You know? I would be tempted to present a really good version of myself all the time. That is the truth. I'm sure none of you do. But this is the world that we're living in, that we're inhabiting. How deadening is the effect of 24-hour news? You know the tragedies that are happening in this world right now? And I don't for a second want to belittle the ones that have been featured in the news. But many, many more people have died around this world than we have seen even on our news. And we're deadened. I, I, I mean, if you'd woken up to news of another terrorist attack, I, I'm going to be totally honest with you. I, a little bit of me would have kind of gone, okay, another one. There is a deadening effect. The, the creed, the belief of self-rightness is in stark contrast with our faith that calls us to come before God on our knees. As God's chosen people, we are to clothe ourselves, to take onto ourselves and into ourselves the supernatural power of God. To be truly motivated by love, the work of the Holy Spirit will be first in our own hearts. I just have to ask myself this question. Do I truly have a soft heart? Or am I, am as I, I go into this summer period, am I, am I slightly hardened at the edges? Do, do I truly need to say to my God, God, please soften this heart so that I might have compassion to see the needs of others. I'm desperate, Lord God, for your spirit to fill the whole of my life, to live not by flesh but by the spirit, which is the calling of God's chosen people. And I know it needs to start with me. Before I think about how I might pray for somebody else, I need to think about how I might pray for myself. Nikki Gumbel, again, in one of the Bible in One Year series quite recently, said, how would you know if you've got a soft heart? You'll know, and you might just like to hear these questions, you'll know because of your love for the poor. You'll know because of the love for your family, especially the ones that you don't get on with. You'll know because of the quality of your love for your friends. And you'll know because of your quality of your love for your critics and your enemies. Gosh, that makes me think. Does that make you think? Jesus, we just want to hear those questions. Spirits, we want to hear those questions to us. Even now, some of us, some of us asking for forgiveness and receiving it.
put some more words up on the screen just to have a look at because it is only out of that place of relationship that we are able to share in Jesus' ministry. Let's put Matthew 9, 35 to 38. Many of us will know this passage. Some of us may not. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and illness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. This is the so what. If you know your Bibles, you'll know that these few verses, they come as the, uh, they're the end, a summary of Jesus' ministry in the previous three chapters. This is what Jesus has been doing. He's been going through the villages, through the towns of his areas. He's been teaching, he's been preaching, and he's healing And then it's a setup. These verses then set up the ministry of the disciples, which is to follow. And guess what, folks? It's to include teaching, preaching, and healing. It's the same pattern. If we just put the scripture up there again, or you've got it open, did you notice that that, that Matthew says, uh, healing every disease and illness. The stress is on the full power of God for healing and for wholeness. That full power that has just been experienced and seen in Jesus' ministry is now to be experienced and realized in the ministry of the disciples. We are filled with the same power that filled Jesus if we will allow ourselves to be. Naturally supernatural because Jesus lived this supernatural life and we're called in the power of the Spirit not to live in flesh but in the Spirit in the same power. There's a restlessness in the verses, isn't there? Did you notice that? There's a, an urgency in it. Jesus has compassion on the crowds because he can see their needs. Now, some of us, again, if we know our Bibles, what's been thought about is two sense of need. There's a political vacuum. There's a, a leadership vacuum for the people, for God's people. But equally, there is a spiritual vacuum for God's people. They are without a shepherd. And like sheep, they are harassed and helpless. Let's just put those words up again just so you can see them there that verse please they're without a shepherd they lack leadership does that sound familiar I mean I'm not making a party political point here stress but do you know anywhere lacking in leadership in all senses politically spiritually, morally, ethically? Do you know anywhere like that at the moment? Are the people harassed and helpless? You don't have to look far, do you? And the harvest... In the Old Testament, harvest often means judgment. But you notice in these verses, it's not angels being sent to reap, but laborers sent to save and bring in. The opportunity, Jesus is saying, is boundless for those who will serve and save the lost. How do you do it? Can we put the last verse up, verse 38? How do we do it? A really good strategy. A really great lead pastor's vision. Special techniques on how to pray with people. More money? No. What do we do? Verse 38. Can you read it with me? Ask the Lord of the harvest. Ask the chief shepherd. T. 
teaching, preaching, healing. Can I just give you three thoughts on those? And they'll somehow perhaps reflect a little bit after a hundred days of listening how I think we might just be beginning to be called. Teaching. I know you've I'm sure I've been asked this question before, but are you a thermostat or a thermometer in your weekly life? So are you reflecting the temperature in your family, in the place that you work, at the school gates, where you volunteer, where you shop, or are you helping to set the spiritual temperature? We are in a culture and a generation harassed and helpless. They need teaching about the truth. And they will look for what we do more than what we say. How do you set the culture, the temperature in your places of being week to week? You know, if you're in a culture where everybody just takes a little bit out of the expenses, everyone takes a little bit of paper, everyone just takes a little bit of few pencils, a few pens, because that's what we do. Everyone just rounds up their expenses. Everyone just, everyone just. How do you be a thermostat? Next term at the school gates, who will be the men and the women standing on their own? There are always some who everybody struggles with because actually they're quite unpleasant sometimes. (laughs) Thermometers will stand with the rest of thermostats might do something different. You want to be naturally supernatural. That is naturally supernatural. That is living life in the spirit. To be the one that goes to the critic, that goes to the enemy and breaks the barrier, breaks it down. So here in Cheltenham and beyond, who are the people that nobody else connects with, that nobody else speaks to? Who are the the critics that we need to love in a fresh and different way? Where we need to go and be the, the thermostat spiritually in this place. Not a thermometer reflecting our culture and our society, but actually spiritually Bringing something new. And friends, I know we need to connect even more than we already have been. It's so at the heart of this church, but even more than we have been with the daily realities of your lives. Secondly, preaching. Again, I want to ask about us being the good news. So thermostats rather than thermometers. Secondly, I want to ask about us being the good news. Gandhi apparently said there were two types of people in the world, those who take the credit and those who do the work. He said, try and be in the second group, there's less competition. (laughs) How can you, how can I How can we be the good news? How will our lives impact on others in a most naturally supernatural way? Again, I make reference to what Richard was sharing last week. That email not only is an act of worship, but also as an act of witness to the good news. Yes, hear me, we want people on Alpha courses. Yes, we do. But Alpha is not the only show in town. What's the beta? And I can't remember what C is in, you know. We absolutely love people coming on Alpha because God uses it. And I am never not going to invite you to invite people to Alpha. But it cannot be the only show in town. How are we going to be the good news 
into our society and culture. And it will be in the way we write emails, the way we make phone calls, the way we speak to our neighbours, the way we have them round for dinner. We, it'll be the normal, natural weave of life. And then, yes, every one of us will need to be ready to answer the question, tell me about this Jesus thing or that stuff you do. No one ever says, would you share the gospel with me? (laughs) And what are you going to say? Because every one of us is called to be a witness. Not an evangelist necessarily, but a witness to what God has done. Are you ready for that question? Are you living a life that would provoke that question to then be ready to answer it. And thirdly, and certainly not least, healing. Teaching ministry, preaching ministry, and a healing ministry for every disease and illness. But the first duty of love is to listen. So when people come to us for healing and wholeness... Will we listen before we dare to suggest what they need? That would apply even as people gather at the front for times of ministry. Do we listen to God first, as well as listening to the needs of the person, rather than wade in? To that person who works beside you, do we truly listen to them? so that we can pray for healing and wholeness of mind, body, and spirit. We have to acknowledge that any one of us can enjoy the buzz of appearing to see God's power at work. Humility is about on our knees, about listening And giving him all the glory. It's praying simply for people. In Jesus name. It is speaking and acting. Lovingly. In a moment I'm going to ask you. Whether God speaks to you about being a thermostat not a thermometer whether God speaks to you about being the good news story, about whether God is speaking to you about being an agent of his healing and wholeness into our society. But first, just something that's really struck me. Again, it may be known to you as a story for some of you. Uh, The film Dunkirk is obviously very current at the moment. Less well-known is the story of the Lancastria. So lots of ships and boats went over to Dunkirk to rescue people from France. But even after those first Dunkirk uh, uh, evacuations, there were thousands and thousands, about 150,000, or certainly a large number, forgive me, that might be the wrong number, but there were thousands of people still stuck in occupied France. And the Lancastria was sent a few weeks later, an undefended cruise ship, to try and rescue as many as possible. It's the greatest loss of life in maritime history, though, because it was attacked by three Messerschmitts. They bombed it. Eventually, it was to sink, and 4,000 people were to lose their lives. 2,500 were to be saved. And as the ship was beginning to list, there was a Navy chaplain moving quietly amongst those who were injured. And he got to the forward hold where apparently about 200 soldiers were trapped. And he jumped in to join them. Of course, he knew he was never to come out. And the survivors, some of them at least said... What gave them the courage to stay afloat until they were rescued 
was the sound of the singing of hymns as the boats sank. That is a life filled with the Spirit. That is a life in my book motivated by love. That is being supernatural very naturally.